All right, guess we're live. Yes, we are. Hello, everyone. I'm Charmaine Webster, and I am a COVID-19 outreach specialist at Thunderous Health Center. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you and our expert, Dr. Claudia Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark is a pediatrician and adult medicine provider caring for kids and adults. And she is here to talk about the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11 years old. If you haven't heard, Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11 is now authorized for use. And Thunder Miss Health Center is ready to vaccinate kids over the age of 5. We have appointments available. Um, so if you're ready to protect your kid uh, from COVID-19 by getting them vaccinated, the best way to schedule an appointment is online with us here at www.thundermishealth.org. Okay. Uh, while COVID-19 is tends to be milder in children compared with adults, it can make children very sick and just cause them to be hospitalized. In some situations, you know, um, the complications from their, uh, for the inspect, um, infections can lead to death. And this brings up a lot of questions about protecting kids from COVID uh, and questions about the COVID-19 vaccine and how it relates to kids. If you have any questions tonight um, and you want our expert to answer them, please just put them in the comments and we'll be sure to get to them. Use this time wisely. Get your questions out there. Okay, Dr. Clark, thank you so much uh, oh, for welcome. doing this. Of course. Yes, yes, we really appreciate it. Um, and our community is here for it. So let's get started with some questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, Dr. Clark, let's kick this off with the big question because this is big news, right? Um, is the vaccine safe for kids? So the short answer is absolutely, yes, it is. Um, the longer answer um, involves the amount of work that went into getting this vaccine to um, fruition and for administration for um, EUA or emergency use authorization for this age group. So there were tens of thousands of volunteers that were involved in the clinical trials. And these are age 5 to 11, since this is the population we're, we're um, targeting for this campaign, although we want all, all of the ages that are eligible to obviously be vaccinated. But um, rest assured that there were lots of little little volunteers that were involved in these um, trials for Pfizer, and they okay. found that there were 91% um, e efficacy in um, preventing severity, severe uh, COVID or COVID itself. And um, so impressive that it went from um, being a um, EUA to an um, the FDA saying that this is something that's part is going to be streamlined for um, full FDA um, authorization mm -hmm. in time. But right now, um, mm -hmm. when they see that there's an efficacy that is um, so high and the need um, of decreasing disease burden in the population is so great, um, they will give this authorization, this emergency use authorization first um, mm -hmm. to allow us to um, to vaccinate as many people as possible. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. From what yeah, you're saying, it kind of seems like like the process with the with the other um, vaccines that have come out. Absolutely. Like, and so mm -hmm. things are like happening um, so fast in in a in a good way that like yes, we have the we we had um, Pfizer that was approved for 12 to 17 year olds. They were already doing clinical trials on. Uh, children younger, the five to 11 age group. And ah. as we speak, they're doing um, children as young as six months old um, okay. so that that can be the next rollout. So I'm really looking forward to that. But um, but right now we're in a good position to, to feel comfortable. We had so many kids that were involved in this trial um, that we have a lot of good data. 
Um, and I think that's important to know, especially when some parents have the reservations that I don't want my child to be a guinea pig or I don't want my child to be one of the first ones. We're, we're so beyond that because we've had so many children that have already been vaccinated through this trial that we, there is, the, the testing has been done. Well, I thank you for getting that information out there because sure. yes, parents are are worried about their child being the first, but we mm -hmm. can rest assured that with the trials that have um, already taken place, a lot of children have already been vaccinated and yes. that's why we're here. Thank yes. you. Um, so another question would be, why would I get my child in this age group vaccinated if they have a mild disease than other age groups? Like if they're, if they get COVID-19 and they don't get as sick, why would I want to get them vaccinated? So while it is true that children um, overall tend to have a milder case, it's still um, hard to predict which kid is going to be the kid that has a more severe disease mm. with one caveat an unvaccinated child, um, certainly if there's gonna be uh, disease severity involved, it tends to be with an unvaccinated child. So if oh. you just look at Rhode Island alone, since the start of school, they've been tracking this from August 29th to up to October 23rd when they've collected their date last data set, 92% of students in Rhode Island, um, pre-K to 12, mm -hmm. who were positive for COVID-19 were not vaccinated. Um, and 67% of those kids were between ages five to 11. So these are this is a population that now we have a vaccine for that could have avoided that outcome. Mm. Um, the myeloid disease is something that I think a lot of people um, focus on, which is a good thing. But I, I think about my child and yeah, that's great that um, a lot of children have a myeloid disease state, but there are children that get quite ill um, and I wouldn't want my child to be that child. And if I could do anything to mm -hmm. protect them from being hospitalized, from having um, a severe complication, like um, I'm not sure how many parents are familiar with multi-system inflammatory syndrome or MIS-C, um, which causes a um, body-wide inflammation and sepsis um, and potential death in, in some of the kids that get it, um, I would want to prevent that. And when we have a vaccine that can prevent a disease that can can lead to death. I mean, I think it's a big deal that we promote that and especially knowing it's a safe one and we get the message out there and we get as many shots in arms as possible. Uh, yeah, I definitely have to to second that. We definitely want to get the information out there and and, and so parents can be equipped um, to make the, the right decisions for their children. Uh, thank you. Um, so other questions that I've gotten would be, we want to know, and you kind of spoke to this, um, what studies have been done on the vaccine and the vaccine's effects on children and how that relates specifically to this five to 11 age group? So the studies that have been done on the five to 11 age group, I did refer to where we had about 10,000 kids in that trial, the clinical mm -hmm. trial. Um, vaccine development for children is no different from vaccine de uh, development for adults in that they don't really deviate from the standard where you have okay. a, three, a pre a preclinical trial, a clinical trial, and then um, there's a third phase where you're looking to see if there's any side effects. You're kind of it's like a waiting period after, um, mm -hmm. and then you're seeking authorization for use. So mm -hmm. they went through all of those. No 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 trial phases were skipped for for the children. Um, so there's nothing different about how the um, vaccine development took place. Yes, they already had um, a, an established vaccine. So it wasn't like they were going de novo, but they needed to be very um, careful and mindful about the dosage and what was a safe dose um, for this age group. Okay. All right. Um, and um, on that note, is the dosage, you know, and again, you're speaking to this now, but is the dosage the same as adults? No. And, okay. So for um, children 5 to 11, it's actually a third of the dose. Ah. Um, so once okay. you're 12 and over, it's a, it's a full dose. As, um, it's, a, it's a full dose, but for that age group, it's a third. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. No problem. That's, that's good to know. Um, and what about Moderna and Johnson and Johnson? Are those vaccines available for kids yet or is it? No, um, actually okay. they're not even available for um, 12 to 17 year olds. It's mm. only 18 plus um, at the moment. And I think there's just a matter of getting more data, more efficacy data. Pfizer um, had a more robust uh, body of research and was able, we were, um, you know, the we, but the, the <laughs> government, the FDA was able to authorize um, their study findings and approve them to um, to distribute vaccines, but we're just not quite there yet with Moderna and J and J. So from a safety profile, Pfizer um, is is what we have for our, our younger children. Okay, um, and when I hear that, to me, like as a parent, that just kind of speaks to the fact that um, safety is being taken. Oh, for um, sure, into yeah. Consideration. Yeah. And, um, you know, instead of just pushing them all out for the children, we're taking the research and the data that we have um, mm-hmm. that is comprehensive enough to be where we are. Um, and at the same time, we're holding off in areas where we need to wait and get more data. So um, it is, there is comfort in, in knowing that. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Clark, can you talk a bit about the side effects on kids, um, from the vaccine and like what a normal reaction would be if, if my child um, were to be vaccinated? So what would be typical and expected? And honestly, this would be typical and expected of any vaccine, Mm -hmm. um, just because of the nature of getting a vaccine, what, um, what it's doing to your immune system, you would expect at the injection site to have some tenderness, some swelling, some pain. Um, Mm. But you also have um, what is an immune reaction. So it's essentially your body building um, an an immunologic response. It's producing antibodies against um, what what the body thinks is a COVID antigen, but it is like a synthetic mimic that the body will make an antibody against and produce immunity. So when that happens, you're, you're making your body do some work. And if your body is okay. doing some work, immunologic work, it has a response that's similar to um, any kind of a virus. And in okay. this case, it's pretty mild. So low grade fevers, headaches, feeling really tired, feeling some muscle aches, nausea, but this is typically a 24 to 48 hour type of deal. And it's mm. typically mild. It's nothing like getting an actual infection, but it, you know, when you're going through it, it feels not great. That's, you know, you can't, it's hard to say to somebody, oh, no big deal. You're going to have these things. I mean, for that person and to that child, you don't feel great. And so I think managing your expectations, I don't think it's fair to say there'll be no side effects, that you'll be completely fine. Some people are, um, and that's not a bad thing. If you are, doesn't mean that the vaccine didn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, it's kind of a spectrum and you can think about when you got your child other vaccines, how did they do after that? Do they tend to have a low grade fever? Do they tend to feel kind of achy, um, for a day or two or not? It's, it's really no different. We're not seeing, um, much in terms of the common vaccine reactions. Okay. Um, that being said, there are some, um, less common side effects that can happen, um, if there is an allergy, a severe allergy to any of the preservatives in the vaccine, um, although these are rare, you could experience an, an anaphylactic reaction. Mm. Um, and there is, and this is a good time to discuss this because it's been in the media and it is something that can happen, um, mm. is um, having some inflammation around the sac that that um, the heart sits in, which is called Mm -hmm. the pericardium. You can get a pericarditis or a myocarditis um, from the vaccine itself. The thing that needs to be, um, I guess, mentioned about that is this was seen um, after um, giving it to five, excuse me, giving it to 12 to 17 year olds. And it was reported 54 cases per 1 million um, doses administered. So It's not actually that many. And um, a myocarditis or a pericarditis is a common side effect um, of a viral infection. So you can get that from having COVID and you're more likely to have it from COVID, um, the infection, than you are to um, get it from the vaccine. 
Okay, well, um, that's that's good information to have too, and <clears throat> to set the expectation for our community and the parents, um, so that they can make sure that they're letting their children know, um, you know, what they could expect. And you know, it's it's not all roses, but it's mm -hmm. certainly doable mm -hmm. um, to keep us uh, safe out of the hospital and, and alive and surviving this pa this pandemic. So, right. Um, Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what what would you consider a normal reaction? Would that be like the the tenderness at the injection? Yeah, absolutely. Site? I think and it's completely such. reasonable to have some tenderness or soreness, kind of like a heavy arm um, mm -hmm. after the vaccine um, and feeling a little achy and sore. They're fairly common. Um, sometimes kids will get headaches and that's OK, too. Um, all of these things are treatable. I would say, and I think this is something that was discussed and brought up in the past about um, pain relievers like Tylenol and Motrin and whether it's a good idea to pre-treat before a vaccine. We never recommend that. Um, okay. we, we want your body to have an immune response. We don't want it blunted. We really okay. want the immune response as much as it's unpleasant. The fact that it's happening is actually a good sign that your immune system is working well and ah. is making antibodies to to fight this theoretical thing that's in. So I think sometimes um, a vaccine, like a little vaccine review is helpful um, for people to understand when we give vaccines, we're not actually giving um, the virus or the bacteria, depending on what the, um, the vaccine is for, but we are giving the body something that looks like it Mm -hmm. um, it's typically a synthetic, uh, compound. It's, it's typically something that has a se the genetic sequence that's similar mm -hmm. and the body recognizes that that is not normal. That is not something that belongs in me. I need to make an antibody against this foreign thing called mm -hmm. an antigen, mm -hmm. get rid of it, destroy it so that the next time I'm exposed to it, it like blows it up. It's gone. So there is no okay. reaction. It's as if you were exposed to it in the future and you had no reaction. And that's what we want. We don't want you to be exposed to the real thing and get sick. So that's like the whole idea. And if you do get exposed to it and you do get sick, because that can happen, mm -hmm. it is milder and it's not going lead to lead to hospitalization or death because your body is primed for it. It's ready and it's already has antibodies ready to attack. Okay. So we're, this is a way for us to build up a defense. Exactly. Um, so we're we're ready for the real war. So this is yeah. this is us prepping up, prepping our bodies to be ready for the real war, um, if the situation arises. And yeah, um, I mean, you can think about vaccines mm -hmm. as like basic training. Um, you're getting yeah. ready for the real war. Yeah. You want that. You want your um, your immune system to be well qualified for the fight. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that it's, you know, especially when we're talking about our children, it's, it's, it's hard and, and we just need to make sure we're taking in all the information. So when we're making these decisions and as, you know, we're going through our process of um, getting the shot um, and, and getting the vaccine, um, we, we know what to expect. Yeah. Um, and cause that, that, that's game changing, like knowing what to accept expect um you know we're we're we as a people we're we're afraid of the unknown so knowing what to expect definitely um helps me as a parent um and so. i think it's reasonable for parents to be concerned about any vaccine you want to make sure you're doing what's right for your child it's mm -hmm. one thing when you're doing it to yourself or for yourself but when it's another little being you of course you want to have um all the information you can to make the right decision i don't think that there's anything wrong with um, parents being concerned and wanting to ask questions and feel comfortable um, about the decision they're making. But I mm -hmm. also at the same time um, would like to convey that there has been a lot of work done to make sure that it is a safe decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Of course. Um, you know, and as I spoke to a lot of people are wondering, you know, what are the risks of the COVID-19 if our children get infected? And we've spoke to that. Mm -hmm. um, will it be severe? Um, you know, which we don't know unless 
the the child unless your child gets it we can't um, speak to if it will or not but we know that if they do have the vaccine it will be less severe with that um and but can you speak to um the risk of our kids giving COVID-19 and outweighing the risk of them um getting sick from the vaccine like because now parents are like okay so they can get a little sick from the vaccine or certain things may happen from the vaccine Mm -hmm. now i'm at the point where i have information here i have information here like can you can you weigh those those so what i think that would be helpful is to just take a little um trip into what it's like for a child to have covid um Mm. compared to what those side effects that we've talked about are Mm -hmm. so yes we've talked about how when a child has covid the symptoms tend to be mild and and cold-like, but they're still going through an infection that has a spectrum of uh, severity and a spectrum of responses. And so it can, symptoms can range from fever, a cough Mm -hmm. that's productive, that um, classic loss of taste or smell. Um, Some kids are getting some skin changes, discolorations in their hands and feet, um, sore throat, Mm -hmm. diarrhea, uh, nausea and vomiting, belly pain, Um, muscle aches, extreme fatigue, uh, a severe headache, and nasal congestion. And this can go from, um, you know, something mild to something that plagues them. And and so the thing that I mean by plaguing them, we're learning about um, these long haulers, these people with long COVID syndrome. Yeah, For a while, we thought that kids didn't get it, but Mm -hmm. they do. And so um, it is very difficult having a child who has months and months and months going closer to year of muscle aches, Mm. fatigue, headaches, um, kind of like a difficulty concentration and brain fog. um, And it's constantly in in pain in their joints. So this is, um, I mean, yes, we think about the extreme things of having um, Miss C and having Um, respiratory failure and intubation and being in the hospital and death. And yes, those things happen, not commonly. And yes, those things are terrible. But what also is, I think, on on another level of terrible is having a child that can't learn, can't concentrate, is uncomfortable, is in pain all the time. And there is not much you can do about it um, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the Tylenol emotion is not helping. And this is like, you just, this is how life is like, and we don't know how long it's going to take. For you to get over it because the doctors don't know that is a horrible thing to have to tell a child hmm. so if we can avoid something like that for a, a long haul i mean i i take care of both um children and adults and i have to say i i've only had a couple of children as patients that have had this issue thankfully okay. because less of them have had covid but okay. you know the longer this pandemic sticks around the more likelihood that we're going to have people that who are unvaccinated that are exposed to it and have it. And we really can avoid that. We can avoid, I, I, I don't know if anyone can speak to um, knowing anyone who's in chronic pain, but I certainly mm-hmm. don't want my child to be in chronic pain because they're, they have a long life ahead of them. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, that's all. That's heavy information, but very necessary. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and something else that concerned myself um, and other parents of, of our community. Uh, what about fertility? You know, um, our children, this is this is a young age group. You know, we want to. Sure is. You know, would, would my child's possible for fertility be affected in the future? You know, I, I certainly well, want grandchildren. So I'm actually not really sure where this fertility misconception concern came from, because there is no evidence for vaccines that have existed in history, history and exist today. And for the COVID vaccine, there's no evidence that, um, that any of the vaccine ingredients are going to cause problems to um, affect someone's ability to become pregnant, that are going to affect sperm. And because it's interesting when people have a concern, but it's not backed in um, like actual data. Sometimes 
the research will follow the concern just because it's out there and they're like, why are people mm. saying this? So now they're doing studies just to prove this, just because people are talking about it. It is okay. a little bit more difficult to do it with, with, um, uh, five eggs. to 11. Well, yeah. Cause now you're looking, you're, I mean, you, that's a long time to look out, but you can look at sperm and study mm. sperm. Um. And just, so they've actually been doing that. Um, with okay. men who have gotten the COVID vaccine because they've had there's, there's some men that have had it for longer, um, and they're seeing absolutely no change in the, the characteristics, vitality of the sperm after vaccination. But this concern came out from um, stuff that's been online about fertility that there wasn't really any basis in um, reality, I guess, in terms of like vaccines having a problem because a lot of the vaccines that are out there use similar technologies. I mean, our mRNA technology is used in other vaccines that we commonly get. Um, yeah. And the preservatives, which are a lot of salts, um, are, are in our food that we eat. And they're also in other vaccines. So they're mm. not like they're not things that we haven't been exposed to. So mm -hmm. if you break it and parse it by the ingredients, it's not. Um, we're certainly eating preservatives in our food and we're able to reproduce just fine. So there isn't really like a real reason to suspect that this would be an issue. But because people have this concern, they're now doing research to demonstrate to people that this is this is not an issue. And so, so, so far, what we are seeing so far, there's no reason to believe this. And the, there's more evidence coming out um, that it's not a problem. And um, it is difficult. I um, can attest to this personally when there isn't information about a concern that you have. Um, namely, when this vaccine first came out, there really was no meaningful data on pregnant mm -hmm. women. And so it's hard when you're in the middle of a pandemic and pregnant and you want to be protected and you want to pro protect your future child. And you don't know whether it's a safe thing to do because no one's focusing on your group. You know, that's really hard. I was oh, in that position yes. when um, I'm as a healthcare worker, I was eligible to get the vaccine very early and it was before. ACOG and before the CDC and before the departments of health were saying like absolutely pregnant women should get it like they are now they were like mm -hmm. we don't know it's up to you well uh, how can you make it up to the um how are you you're not a doctor I I was a doctor and I still was like how am I supposed to know right um, right I don't know enough about this vaccine in pregnant women because you don't know as a researcher so it's right. really hard when you're faced up against that um what I found actually really helpful, um, UMass um, Medical, or excuse me, UMass Memorial, if okay. you go to their website, they have a decision tool for pregnant women that are considering the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, I use that. I use that with my OB, and this is before the blanket recommendations to get it were out there. But I think it's helpful to look at the cost benefit of what the vaccine looks like in a pregnant woman versus not, and your personal risk, what your medical problems are. Mm -hmm. And it, it becomes clear that getting the vaccine is far outweighs the risk of hospitalization, which is higher when you're pregnant and you're already in immunocompromised state by the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you add in any complications, you have um, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, it's just adding more risk. And it was like, after looking at that, I was like, even if there hasn't been enough studies in women that are pregnant, I'm going to be that pregnant woman that gets it. And I got it my second trimester, my 20th week, I got my first Moderna and I got my second series a month later. And I am so happy I did it. I got my booster okay. last week with Pfizer. All um, right. And I, I think it's the best decision I made. And my daughter has been fantastic. I am so excited that I could give her some protection mm -hmm. um, while I was pregnant and pro producing antibodies that cross. Uh. Um, and then giving her, because uh, another thing is... Um, breastfeeding and lactating women um you it's a different type of antibody that you're giving it's um an iga and it doesn't last that long it, it's a short-lived secretory um, um antibody so it's not mm -hmm. the same as an igg that you get when you're vaccinated so to give her both igg and iga was like oh yes i felt like i was doing something for her that could protect her during this pandemic mm -hmm. that she didn't ask to be born in Mm. So, <laughs> yes, yes. How old is your baby now? He's six months old and she's fantastic. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> I love Congratulations. So much. Thank and you. And yes, we're, we're, we're happy to know that, that you made the right decision and all is well. All is well. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, 
speaking to the five to 11 year old group, sure. um, if they were to get the flu vaccine and they needed the COVID vaccine, can they get those simultaneously? Because, you know, this is the season. This is the season. And if you can get your vaccines out of the way, please do. Uh, oh, okay. This is a this is a COVID talk, but I don't know if you've been hearing. I've been getting the provider updates from the Rhode Island Department of Health. We're mm-hmm. already in flu season. We've already got about 30 cases. Like we're ready to rock. Usually this is like a December situation, but we're now in an early December, or excuse me, an early November situation and we're like rocking and rolling. So flu okay. is here. Last year we dodged that flu bullet, but we are certainly not doing it this year. Um, and it's looking like it's a more severe strain. So mm-hmm. please get both of these vaccines. You can get them on the same day. It does not matter. They will okay. both be just as effective. All right. All right. Well, that's a good tidbit of information. For um, sure. Yeah. I yeah. do not want to mess with both. Exactly. Exactly. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so another aspect um, would be parents that are concerned, like their children already had COVID, you know? Mm-hmm. So if they've already had COVID, would you recommend getting vaccinated? Or do you think the child should still get vaccinated even though they've had COVID and they have, you know, the antigens fighting somewhat? You know, what's your recommendation to that? So while it is true that after you get any infection, any illness, you do produce antibodies, Mm -hmm. um, what they're finding specifically for COVID and specifically for this age group, since this is the, the topic we're focusing on, um, they're consistently showing that even though these, um, the um, children who have been exposed to um, COVID and have COVID, um, they do produce antibodies. Thank God they do. Um, they do wane. Um, so they're not a robust mm. response like a, a COVID vaccination is. Okay. Um, so a vaccinated, vaccinating an individual who was previous, previously infected is a, an immune boost like no other. And you were able to sustain your antibody levels for much longer. Um, what we were seeing um, with, with everyone for the most part was after your COVID infection, you do produce antibodies pretty precipitously, but they do tend to taper off after three months. And so they're seeing a, a robust and a, a long lasting um, impact with the um, COVID vaccination. The only caveat to that was the Delta variant um, mm-hmm. that there was, um, and that is the reason why we have a booster for adults. And um, is there was there was some there were some studies that were just it wasn't quite as effective against that mutation. But people were still having strong antibodies. Um, and people who have um, immunocompromising conditions, it doesn't matter what vaccine they get, they're likely going to need a booster um, to maintain their antibody levels. That has nothing to do with the COVID vaccine and everything to do with their body's ability to make antibodies that um, that in, an, in, a, in a sufficient quantity to keep them safe. So that okay. is probably a, a, certainly is an issue that you would set aside because that's mm. a different that's a different type of person. And there are children that are in that category too. Absolutely. And so I think would probably cross that bridge pretty soon. There's going to be. Um, I, I suspect there's going to be EUAs that are, have caveats for immunocompromised children. We're just not there yet because we're rolling it out mm-hmm. for the first time with kids. So, um, but that is going to be an issue that we're going to have to um, look at as a mm-hmm. scientific community is what about your, the immunocompromised compromised kids? Okay. Okay. Well, we look forward to that research and yeah, of course um, I do too. Yeah, definitely. You know, and and again, um, that also speaks to the fact that as we get more information, we get more research, um, that we that we adjust um, our guidelines as we go along. So, and it's the same as anything else. I think Mm -hmm. I think we all have to remember that this isn't really a new phenomenon of needing um, a vaccine in series. Um, Just think Mm -hmm. about your childhood immunizations and how many of those do we give multiple times. How many times right. do you get hepatitis B? How many right. times are you getting Prevnar? How many mm-hmm. times are you getting HIV? There's a reason behind that. Mm-hmm. Not everyone produces enough antibodies to sustain Im- um, immunity so that you can say one and done. That's certainly right, right, not right. the case with hardly any of them. 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we have to give we have to give series, we have to give boosters for some, and that's just the way it is. Um, okay. So this is no different. Um, the vaccine is, in my mind, no different and not any more special. The thing that I think is um, tough is that we're in this pandemic. If this was 10 years from now, we wouldn't need to be having this conversation because people would just accept that we need to protect against this. So we don't mm-hmm. want to go through 20, 2020 again, you know? But we, we're in it. We're in it still. You know, this is only yeah. 2021 and the, the pandemic is certainly not over. Mm-hmm. So it's harder for us to look at it that way because we're mm-hmm. just we're we're still learning things about, mm-hmm. um, you know, long COVID and complications in certain age groups. Um, but what we are seeing is a vaccine is quite effective and would be even more effective if we had um, herd immunity, which is what we're working towards with getting all of these age groups. In, included and involved in a vaccination campaign. Awesome. And I heard you, you know, you're mentioning herd immunity. Can you just explain that um, in, in layman's terms to our, to our sure. community? Sure. So it essentially means that you have this critical number um, that protects your community against an, any kind of infection or illness. And for every um, community, that can be a little bit different. Um, mm-hmm. If you tend to have a population with a lot of elderly people, if you have a population with a lot of young people. But overall, um, when we think about it, we are taking everyone into account um, so that we're not, um, because there's always gonna be a a subset of people that can't get the vaccine for an allergy reason. They get anaphylaxis. They know they get anaphylaxis against some component in the vaccine. their immune Mm -hmm. system is so compromised that they can't get anything um, Mm -hmm. because it could be a life-threatening situation or they're too little and the vaccine isn't available for them yet, like babies and where that hopefully will like, we'll get to a point where, um, you know, the six months to up to four years will be included, but we're just not there yet. Okay. Um, But um, so there's always going to be people, premature babies that can't get the vaccine. And when we have herd immunity, it is a critical number, which is usually calculated by a lot of metrics that and that are looking at um, some of the things I mentioned, like who is in your community okay. to come up with a number of per, or a percentage. And that's why a lot of um, the departments of health are keeping track of the percentages of people per age group, per community, um, per state. Um, that are vaccinated because they're trying to get to this magic number, this magic number that they have that would mean for their community that everyone's protected. Oh, um, wow. And so the herd is us. Um, yeah. And so the herd is the vaccinated folks in the community, mm-hmm. the community being vaccinated and unvaccinated. And if the herd is um, immune, then the community is safe. Mm. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. So um, just another quick question about that. So yeah. is it is it kind of like if um, if COVID-19 is the villain trying to go around to find a host person to live in and thrive in, um, does this kind of shut it down so that everyone is protected and it doesn't have any place to live and grow? Is it is it like that or no? You could think of it like that. If you have a, this critical number, if you have enough people in your herd that are essentially like your supermans and your superwomen and your, um, your super folk for the non-binaries out there um, that are protecting everyone else, the, you know, the immunocompromised, the weak, the babies, everyone who can't help themselves we are going to um, be able to more effectively fight this villain Um. that um, is trying to wreak havoc in our community because there's so many of us that are creating this wall that there's no place for that, that villain to really penetrate because Mm -hmm. we've, we've we've taken care of um, we've taken care of penetration. Yeah. We might have a little, um, little crack in our wall, but it's a percentage that is so small that it's not enough to um, permeate the community because the herd is strong. Okay, so we wouldn't have like a, a massive outbreak again. Yeah, there would be no outbreaks anymore. All and right. um, yeah, it would be 
it would be a great place, um, mm -hmm. a, great, a great state of mind. And mm -hmm. we've and, and we've had that and with other vac with other excuse me with other illnesses and diseases historically. It's yeah. just that we're still in it, this. You know, we're going to mm -hmm. be out of this eventually, mm -hmm. but. Um, there is that the notion of it burning itself out, but I, I don't like thinking about that because that means that a lot more people die. Mm. Um, so I would rather um, people be vaccinated and we just end it by um, there's no more of a, there's no more host. There's no more vector for the mm -hmm. villain to penetrate because we've put up these walls and we've protected everyone. And I, I think that's a better um, that is a better way to approach a, a pandemic. Um, instead of like just simply losing a bunch of people. Yeah. To the pandemic. Why? Right. Why are we ruining <laughs> lives like this? Like when we could we could be saving lives. I mean, this is this is why a lot of healthcare workers are doing what they do. This is why a lot of first responders are staying in their jobs when they're exhausted and burnt out. Yes. Like, we want this to be over as badly as everyone else does, but we just mm -hmm. want to keep people safe while we do it. Absolutely. And and hats off to that entire um, segment of the population, including yourself. Um, we, we absolutely appreciate the the hard work and the commitment um, that you're giving to keep to keep us safe. Thank you. Uh, so if my child gets vaccinated mm -hmm. and goes to school in person mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, should they still have to follow like the same precautions to prevent COVID, like masking and such? Or are they kind of like off the hook because now they're vaccinated? So should, do they still have to follow all the same precautions and why? So, yes, they do. And why is um, a, why multi, mm -hmm. a, mul a multi part answer? Um, okay. The first thing is we already talked about how. Um, you're going to need more than one vaccine to be completely immune. And so one shot isn't enough. So I guess that would be uh, the subset of that question would be if I have a completely immunized, immunized child, do th can they be off the hook? The answer would still be no, because we still need to respect um, the laws and the policies set forth by the school department, by the local school community, by the city that your school's in, by the state. Um, there are many reasons why, if you're vaccinated and you're protected, why you can't be unmasked in um, a setting with so many people, like a school. Mm. There, um, there are rules that the schools have about social distancing, which is great, but you can still, um, we're still, we're still seeing that there is this phenomenon after you get the vaccine that you can be a carrier, you can be an unaffected carrier, so you carry no disease burden, but you have this exposure to it and you potentially could transmit so that's yeah. one factor that would be um, prevented or significantly minimized by wearing masks. Mm -hmm. um, there's also children that have immunocompromised states that they get the vaccine and they just don't respond. They just don't get a strong enough response. And so if they're exposed to the vaccine in kind can still get COVID. Um, but we also are gonna always have um, a subset of people that either can't or won't uh, be immunized and we have to find a way, some way to protect them. And so these policies are not to be an inconvenience or a nuisance to people, but they're to protect our children. Mm -hmm. And so if a school system is saying that we still need you to mask up, you mask up. I work in a health center. I work at Thunder Mist. I'm fully mm -hmm. vaccinated and boosted. I wear a mask every day. It's just, it's just what you do to protect people. It's, it, it is what it is. And, and it would be nice um, I, I think at some time, like it's it stinks wearing it, but at this we've been so far into the pandemic. I, I almost feel like it's mm -hmm. if, if it's just one thing that we can do to help our our, our like our other um, peer, our our classmate out. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're we're gonna have to do it until we we don't need to anymore, and, and there'll be a light at the end of the tunnel. But I, I think we're just gonna have to do it to. Um, to get through this. And I'm hoping that if we get more people vaccinated, a lot of these regulations will go away, these rules, right, right. but we're just mm -hmm. not there yet. So yep. I think we just have to deal with what we're dealing with until we don't have to deal with it anymore. I mean, it, it is kind of like a, a suck it up situation, which is mm -hmm. kind of harsh, mm -hmm. but it's the reality of what we're dealing in. We're still in a pandemic. People are getting sick, people are dying, and it may not be the classmate that's unvaccinated, but it might be that classmate's grandmother that uh, they bring the virus home to. So it's not, 
sometimes they say it's not always about you. It's not always about your kid, but sometimes it is about your kid. Sometimes it's about their grandma. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a, a way for us to get back to the idea of um, villaging. It's not just about ourselves. It's about how do we help each other? How do we protect each other? Um, you know, absolutely. Um, I think about taking care of kids in general. Um, mm -hmm. Now that I have a child, um, you always hear about you know it takes a village, and I feel like I never really had a good sense of what that really meant until I had a child, and it's hard. Um, it is. It's hard. And, it is. and any kind of help you can get, especially when you're exhausted and you have to go back to work I and know. you need your village. And if your village is sick with COVID and can't watch your baby, yep. then you have a child care situation. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want any situations and we don't want to put our um, compromise safety for the sake of convenience. Right. And so, right. I think that we need to be mindful of our village, but we also need to be mindful of other people's villages and how destroyed they can be when one person gets sick and then they have to quarantine, they have to figure out different living situations. It's, True. it's, it's, um, it's just, it's more than just the inconvenience of you wearing your mask. Like there are consequences that mm -hmm. sometimes you don't even see down the line. Right. Um, right. But I, I, it's hard because people are tired, you know, and I'm tired too. But I don't want anybody dying, especially a right. child that it could have been prevented. Exactly, exactly. Same here. Um, you know, cold fatigue is is a real thing. It's uh -huh. real. I'm <laughs> real tired, but it's, at the same real. time, but it's I not. Do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, there there are things that we can do um, to keep each other safe. Um, and one of the most important things we can do is for a vaccine eligible is to get vaccinated. Hey, hey, hey. And mm -hmm. it's not like, and I really, I think sometimes people think we're, it's like an agenda. We're pushing this on, but I push every vaccine. If, if any of my patients are on this line, I don't care what vaccine it is. I'm pushing it. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it really has nothing to do with COVID <laughs> for me. Right, right, I just want right. you protected. I don't want you sick. Exactly. Period. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Um, you know, especially not with things that we have the research, um, you know, science based um, information uh, that we can get out and, and keep our communities safe and, and allow us to to village in other ways. Like, let us get past this and and allow yes. us to, you know, get on the other side of this and 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 get back to full community um, events and, you know, <clears throat> having this conversation about something else um, at the library with a group of us, you know, um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're going to get there. Um, I'm sure of it. I just want us all to make it there. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Right. Um, <clears throat> so along that line, um, if my child, so if I'm like, okay, I want to get my child vaccinated, you know, five to 11, five-year-olds kind of, they might not necessarily know what's going on, but they know when they're about to get a shot. Um, and then when you're going up to like 11, you know, this is, COVID is so talked about and is everywhere. Um, children know. So we're, we're, we, what do you say if I'm ready to get my child vaccinated, um, but they're not, they don't want the vaccine? Um, but I know it's in their best interest at this point. I have the information. I know it's in their best interest. Like, how should I talk to them? Um, and how should I go about like making these serious decisions um, and, and including them or having them a part of the process um, to where they're at least com at least comfortable enough to have the information um, sure. to process it? So I think being honest and upfront with your children is really important when they're like emotionally ready um, and, and from an emotional maturity standpoint mm -hmm. to understand what you're saying to them. So mm -hmm. I imagine there isn't a parent on the planet that doesn't think about what the bad, cause I mean, I, I worry so much now. I, I feel like this worry, <laughs> I, when is this stop? <laughs> because all I do is worry about stuff and it's crazy. Welcome. So, <laughs> I can't imagine that there isn't there is a parent that is not worried about this vaccine or anything that can um, have a negative outcome or consequence for their child. 
And so mm -hmm. I think it's reasonable for your child to be worried too. Yeah. But I think you channel yeah. your worry and you say, you know what, I was worried too. And I got as much information as I needed to, to feel comfortable about you getting this vaccine. Mm -hmm. this is, these are X, Y, and Z, why I think it's important. Um, I really value having grandma in our lives and we haven't really been able to spend time with her in the same way. I really, mm -hmm. you know, see how happy you are when you go to camp. I really want you to go back to camp in a way that's more meaningful. I really want you to enjoy singing on the church choir. You, you, your, you know, your eyes lit up when you did that every year. I want you to be able to go back and do these things. Mm -hmm. I want you to be able to enjoy your life the way it was meant to be enjoyed as a child or as a human being at this point, because I don't feel like our quality of lives are what they were pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. But we want to sure. get there and we want and our children matter and how they feel matter and their happiness matters. Um, but keeping them safe and keeping them from getting an infection that has serious consequences matters, too. And so in a way that they can understand it with as much information or as little information as you can convey to get to the point that they would come to a, a place of understanding, they mm -hmm. don't have to like it. They don't have to be excited about getting a shot. I don't I seldom feel like children are. Mm -hmm. um, but if they understand why it's important that they're doing something for their community, I mean, some, I see a lot now, five to 11 year olds, their parents posting on social media and they're getting their vaccines, calling them heroes, whatever it is to like hype them up. Everybody mm -hmm. needs to be hyped up. I feel like I need to be hyped up sometimes. Certainly children need to be hyped up, be their hype man or their hype woman or their hype, hype person and let them know that they're doing a good thing for society, mm -hmm. for themselves to keep them safe, for their family, um, whatever it is that you can do to really hype them up, that this is really a good thing you're doing. And I thought this through as your parent and I love you so much. And I think that this is something that you really need to do. Um, and that's why we're doing it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it would probably go over better than Oh, I made an appointment for you to get the COVID vaccine tomorrow. You're going. Right. That doesn't convey right, right. any of your concern, your love, your worry um, in a way that makes them pumped to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so so I yeah, I can appreciate that. Um just kind of taking them along on the journey as opposed to this is the end result and you're here. And that's just that. And, yeah. you know, I mean, at some point as parents, we, we have to get to where we, you know, we have to just go ahead and, and make that decision. Um, yeah. I mean, you're you your know, child but, and you know what they need. You, obviously, the conversation you're having with one child is going to be a completely different from another child who may not be able to emotionally handle the information you're giving them. So, yeah, you, right. parse, it, you parse it down the way that parents do um, mm -hmm. so that they and then whatever it is that helps to keep them comfortable, safe and happy. That means bringing that tablet. That means bringing that smartphone. That means mm -hmm. bringing that blanket. That means bringing whatever it is that soothes them, makes them comfortable. You bring that with a visit so they have that security that makes them feel better or distracts them. Whatever exactly. Or reward after the Or fact. reward after because they are a hero and they did a big thing. They yeah, did a big and... thing for themselves. They did a big thing for their family. They did a big thing for society. It's a big deal. This is not, um, we're in a pandemic. So it's not just any vaccine. It's a vaccine that can save someone's life in real time. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I think that's that's good information on how, you know, parents can handle it. But, um, you know, because that's a, a wide range, five to 11 or even five and up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's giving just enough information age appropriate and then child appropriate because even all five-year-olds don't process some five-year-olds are asking for more information oh yeah um and some you know are better just mm, i'd rather just keep it fluffy and light mm -hmm. so you know your child best um and yeah just but giving them some information so they can feel empowered and absolutely um, just and, like and everything else and for parents that need help with that, I mean, they don't have to figure this out in, in, in isolation. They can speak with their pediatricians and their yeah. family medicine doctors about this. I mean, there's, I think mm -hmm. that that's a reasonable um, concern to have. And it's a, a valuable visit um, mm -hmm. to just talk to your doctor about how do I do this and how do I make this happen? And what does that conversation look like with my child? So mm -hmm. that's also something that you can consider. 
and maybe even include the doctor in in that conversation. Yeah, that's um, what I mean. Without like necessarily having... getting the vaccine and, yeah. and then going back for that. Okay. Yeah. That's that's great. Um yeah, that's that's a that's a great um point to make. Um thank you. Uh but let's say that I'm not a Thunder Miss patient. Mm -hmm. Um my child can my child still get the vaccine here at Thunder Mist? And Absolutely. Um, okay, great. We're so ready, willing, and able to vaccinate this community. You don't need to be a Thunder Mist patient at all. Okay. Um, you can come to our convenient care. Everyone mm -hmm. vaccinated over the age of five can be vaccinated there. Mm -hmm. um, we have a walk in model as well as an appointment model. Um, they're open eight, eight in the morning to eight in the evening. Um, they're open on weekends and there are a lot of holidays. I was shocked um, that they're also open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of opportunities, very few excuses for finding an, um, an available time to get the vaccine because we are ready. We are ready to vaccinate your child. All right. All right. Well, thank you. And we're here for it. Um, I know that you spoke to this, but can you just recap? Because I think it's important for people to mm -hmm. know that um, getting the vaccine is your lived experience. Like you're not telling us what to do. You're showing us by example. So once again, can you just give a little recap on your experience getting the vaccine? Like, what was it like for you physically? Were you nervous going in? Um, so Why sure. did you yeah, I was, ultimately make the choice? I was absolutely 100% nervous going in. Um, like I had mentioned before, I was early in my second trimester. There wasn't a, yeah, a formal recommendation. And it's my first pregnancy. Oh, and I did... Um, IUI, like some in vitro stuff. So I was like, this oh, is a lot baby. of work and a lot of money. And this was and a lot of heart. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really <laughs> unfortunate if I were to lose this child, you know, for something I could have waited on. But I weighed the risks and it was worth it. It was worth it. I did not want to have COVID while I was pregnant. And, mm -hmm. you know, my situation may have been a little bit different as a healthcare worker where I was being exposed more than most. Um, yeah. But there are other occupations where you're at risk and you're exposed to in your pregnancy, depending on the, t the line of work you do. Um, but let's take that out of the equation for a minute. And let's say I wasn't a healthcare worker. Mm -hmm. um, I am a black woman. Um, mm -hmm. And let's be real. There are a lot of issues um, around uh mortality for black women mm -hmm. um, and their babies. So mm -hmm. anything that would decrease my risk of a complication that would keep, that keep me in that hospital longer, I mm -hmm. wholeheartedly wanted to avoid. All right. Um, I also um, was concerned about, I had hypertension. I was concerned about um, what that would do for my baby and mm -hmm. what that would do with having COVID and hypertension and how, um, what kind of complications I potentially would have from having um, stress, putting too much stress on um, my um, my growing child. So yeah, I, I, I like could have been a rep for that um, UMass Memorial um, mm -hmm. decision tree because every mom group I was in, I was like, you should use this. It really was helpful because it was just like, you know, you were. You're way you're weighing your risks, and at the end they were like stacked because I was uh, black, black, not not under thirty five, hypertensive. You know, like it was just like yes. boom, 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 oh, healthcare baby. worker, and it was just like it was just giving you numbers of risk, and I was like, oh geez, oh geez. So uh, it really did help. Um, I got my my ser my Moderna series. Mm -hmm. Vaccine wise, from like a, a side effect standpoint, I did have a sore arm. But I had no fever. I had no headache. I had no um, like cold-like symptom. I was okay. tired, but to be real, I was like already tired, so it was pregnant, hard for me to right. yeah, it was hard for me to distinguish my fatigue from like my pregnancy insomnia mm -hmm. with my COVID vaccine fatigue. So it was all kind of like the same. Mm -hmm. um, and then my Pfizer booster. I'm currently lactating. Um, I had definitely had side effects from that. Like I definitely had a uh, huge lymph node, swollen arm, body aches, um, 
fatigue, although my baseline fatigue is like a little bit better. It's not much better, Mm -hmm. Um, but I was feeling it. But at the same time, I was pumped that I was feeling it because I was looking at that lymph node and I was like, that's where antibodies are made. Yes, yes. So I'm making a hell of a lot. My immune response (laughs) is fire. Mm -hmm. So I was actually pretty upset. I mean, not pretty upset. I was pretty pumped about it. I was upset by how painful it was. Yeah. But it only lasted for 48 hours and then it went away. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm like, this is great. This is great. I have protecting my baby. So I was pretty pumped about that. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm fully vaccinated. Um, I'll get my yes. booster shot when I can. Yeah, yes. and um, like others, um, I was extremely vaccine, um, COVID nineteen vaccine hesitant. Um, I I I weighed and I weighed and I weighed and I weighed and I weighed, and eventually I realized that I just needed to get out of my own head, look at the facts, look at the research, um, and make a judgment from that. Uh, because mm-hmm. it was time for me to make a judgment for my children, right? And once I made it for myself, and I looked and I saw, you know, looking at the research, looking at the data, um, talking to, uh, you know, my doctors, uh, my children's doctors, it was, it, it was, it was, it was time to do it. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that I did. It was, it was really like. Um, I won't say self-induced fear, but, you know, fear coming from a place that I really couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. So, um, you know, and my children are, are vaccinated. Um, so I, I, um, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy that they're, that we're keeping them, that we're, we're doing, we have to do to keep them safe and my mom as well, you know, um, and, and so Absolutely. Um, with that said, uh, I would like to take a look and just look in these comments and see if I see any comments uh, from any. Oh, okay. I actually so, didn't realize we had any, but it looks like we actually have quite a few. Well, we have, we at least have, so I see um, we have um, um, Ms. Dowdy, Ms. Jackie Dowdy, just, you know, asking questions for the community, you know? So um, if you have a baby, um, do you know if there'll be a vaccine for the baby that is like one and a half years old? Like so now people on. are really getting concerned about their, you know, all right, so we got five and up. Mm-hmm. What about like our younger children? So there are trials, clinical trials underway currently for children, um, the, the lowest, the, 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 so going from six months old up to four years old, okay, um, yeah, you but mentioned they're that. not ready. Um, it's not, there's nothing, like, there's, there's still time to do mm-hmm. these trials and it's not certainly not being rushed. So mm-hmm. um, I've heard of, I'm in a few um, doctor mom groups. I've heard about some um, toddlers from the group that are in the trial. Okay. Um, I don't, I think it's tough too when your child is that young. There might not be a ton of people that young that are like willing to sign their child up. Right, right. Um, so I think they, it's kind of like a coalition of the willing. Like they need enough num- numbers. Um, now that my child's six months, I do need to actually look into it because I wouldn't be opposed to her being mm-hmm. in the trial. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. but I don't know if it needs to be a child that has no exposure to COVID, um, antibodies at all. Right. 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 That nuance I'm not quite sure about because she's, she's had protection now in two different ways, Mm -hmm. but, um, they are working on it, Jackie. It's just not ready yet. Okay. Um, but I think if you go over to the comments, there are some, there are a few comments of people who've commented a few times, um, Mm -hmm. Now it is true just to address, um, there's a couple that have been commenting a few times that um, there was one COVID death that was a pediatric case that I it was actually a patient that I was peripherally involved in, but then they actually took it back um, in Rhode Island because I think their thinking was that it was more likely that this child died of the other conditions that, that they had um, and not the COVID per se. But there are certainly children that have died in this country of COVID, um, not that many, um, and that's great. But um, it's not just COVID death, like I had mentioned, that we're concerned about. We're concerned about 
long-term sequelae of having COVID. And that certainly is well-established and well-established in the state that children are having long COVID. And um, I think preventing death is a huge thing to consider when you're thinking about a vaccine, but lifelong disability, I think, is a valid reason to not want your child to, ha to have COVID. And it's a valid reason to be vaccinated too. And I think that that's a reasonable um, consideration when you're talking about a vaccine um, because it's a big deal as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so taking a look at the I don't know comments. how you want to address what, yeah. Yeah, we've, um, we've, I've taken a look at the comments. We've addressed like all of the issues and concerns that we see there. Um, and <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, that joined us this evening, um, especially our community that came to ask their questions and get their feedback. You can share this. And if you have any other questions, you can certainly reach out to your um, pediatricians, your doctors, or give us a call here at Thundermist. Um, and with that said, Dr. Clark, thank you so very much. Um, we enjoy getting to know our providers, our sponsors, and we're able to answer your questions. Uh, Thundermist strongly recommends everyone age five and older to get the COVID-19 vaccine. The vaccine is the best way to keep you and your family safe, um, to schedule an appointment, you want to uh, visit our website, okay? That will be www.thundermisthealth.org. Uh, you can also check with your child's healthcare provider, like I mentioned, um, and about whether they offer the COVID-19 vaccine. You can walk into any of our convenient care locations we mentioned um, for the COVID-19 vaccine. Convenient care is open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. during the week and 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends and holidays. And we have three locations, Woonsocket, which is 450 Clinton Street, West Warwick, which is 186 Providence Street, uh, and South County, which is 1 River Street in Wakefield. You don't need to be a Thunder Mist patient. There's no out-of-pocket costs. There's no government presence. Uh, and, you know, we also have 5 to 11 school-based vaccine clinics that are taking place in certain areas now. Mm -hmm. um, so that information can be called, uh, pulled up at vaccinateri.org. Again, that's vaccinateri.org. I really appreciate and respect um, everyone coming out and joining us tonight. Thank you so very much. And Thundermiss is here to answer questions. This is an open-ended conversation. We appreciate you all. Have a great rest of your night.